and welcome to another episode of Crimes and Witch Demeanors. I'm your host, Joshua Spellman. Okay, so I feel like I have to apologize first that last week there was no episode. My computer completely broke and I wasn't able to record because I don't have any of my software or my research available. So I do apologize for that. So far, January has felt like, like a year. This month has felt like a year. Suffice to say that last week was a complete whirlwind, and I can't even imagine what this week will bring. Oh, wait, I can. And it's another whirlwind because today we are covering the legend of Louisville's witch tree and the storm that sprouted it, the storm demon. But we'll talk more about the storm demon and really poor modern reporting later, as we do on this podcast. This particular legend is a case where the truth is far stranger than fiction, or at least a lot more disturbing, terrifying, and heartbreaking. The contemporary articles about the legend of the witch's tree make it seem like the storm demon was this little itty-bitty inconsequential tornado that swept through part of Louisville and destroyed like one neighborhood and that was kind of it. But all the articles about the witch tree leave out the part that this tornado was actually part of a mass casualty event that impacted like a very large portion of like the Midwest slash wherever you would consider Louisville to be. That area, um, it left hundreds dead and even more injured. So without further ado, let us hear the legend as it's typically told through muddled sources and then learn about the horrifying truths of what really transpired on this day where the witch's tree was sprouted. On the corner of 6th and Park in Louisville, Kentucky, stood a large, tall maple, straight as a pole. It had been there for centuries and provided shade to the citizens of Louisville by day. But by night, below its leafy crown that stretched upwards towards the stars, witches would gather to cast their spells and worship their old gods, or as the Victorians of the era mistakenly believed, the devil. However, in 1889, a chain of events would be set into motion that would topple not only this sacred maple, but half the city of Louisville. Mr. Mengel, of the famous Mengel Lumber Company, was head of the city's planning committee and was scouting for trees to be used in their May Day celebration when he laid his eyes upon the majestic maple. He knew right then that he had to have that tree and that no other would do. It was so tall and so straight, it was born to be their maypole. The news quickly reached the ears of the witches, perhaps even before the thoughts formed in Mr. Mengel's mind. They are witches, after all. So one night, not long after, under the cover of darkness and a velvet hood, the high priestess of the coven knocked on Mr. Mengel's door. He answered, displeased, having been woken in the dead of night, and even more displeased as she implored him not to cut down their beloved maple tree. I will do no such thing, he bellowed. I will cut down that tree. Please, sir, the high priestess said calmly. I beg you to consider your next actions very, very carefully. I will ask once more for you to not fell our sacred tree. And I will tell you once more that I will be chopping down that tree. Very well, the priestess breathed, looking up from beneath her hood. I asked you nicely, and you refused. Now you and the city shall face the consequences. Before Mr. Mengel could even protest or ask what she meant, dozens of cloaked figures emerged from all directions from behind trees, around the street corners, and some even seemed to appear out of thin air. They slowly began to gather together, clasping hands in a circle as they chanted. This This tree tree shall stand and and not be cut. cut. We We fed her with our our laughter. Our leafy haven you'll not gut or pay forever after. 
But if you, wooden king, prevail and Mother Maple dies, the force of fate shall strike this town in right between the eyes. If our tree falls, yes, fate will call to teach you heartless dunce that all men's work can disappear. Beware, eleventh month. And just as quickly as they appeared, they were gone, leaving only the head witch on Mr. Mangle's doorstep. Don't say I didn't warn you, wooden king. Remember, wood burns. She smiled a wry smile, swept her cloak, turned on her heel, and disappeared into the night. Though slightly shaken, Mr. Mengel paid no mind to the witch's warning, and he proceeded with his plans. The tree was chopped down, and as its heavy trunk smashed to the ground, horrid shrieks could be heard echoing throughout the city. However, the May Day celebration went off without a hitch. The trunk of the maple was adorned with ribbons and decorations of all kinds as men, women, and children danced about it. Afterward, its woody carcass was tossed into the celebratory Whitsuntide bonfire, where it was burned to ash. By this time, after all the joyous celebrations, everyone had forgotten about the witch's warning. But eleven months later, to the very day, the curse would take effect. On March 28, 1890, the witches whipped up a hell of a storm to terrorize the city of Louisville. They first sent it down Maple Street, a sly nod to prove it was their crafty work, and then sent it downtown. Here, the storm flattened buildings, killing and injuring many, and among them were members of the May Day Committee and two members of the Mengel family. And then, according to eyewitnesses, the twister made a bizarre right-hand turn down 6th Street, As it barreled down 6th Street towards Park, the storm hurled a lightning bolt straight into the stump where the sacred maple had once stood. And from this charred base grew what is now known as the Witch's Tree, a gnarled, wretched thing with great burls and thin branches like the bones of a witch's hand. Since the day of the dreadful storm, it is said that the coven has returned to cast their spells beneath the twisted branches of the Witch's Tree. Visitors to Louisville place flowers at the base of the tree and hang beads and charms from its branches as gifts to the city's witches in hopes that they may cast a spell in their favor. However, just across from the tree lie charms against witches, including horseshoes, showing that Louisville still fears the witches. However, since the storm, the citizens of Louisville have never dishonored the wishes of a witch in fear that their city may once again fall to ruin. What a cute little story, right? (laughs) Wrong. The articles about the witch's tree make it seem like it was kind of this little twister that rolled through the city, but no. On March 27th, 1890, there was a tornado outbreak, and it was the most deadly tornado event in United States history. How the articles leave that out is absolutely beyond me. I didn't even know that a tornado outbreak was a thing that could happen. But now that I know it is, I am absolutely horrified. Now, if you are very attentive to detail, you may have caught that I said March 27th and not March 28th. So this is another case of modern journalism recounting the date that an event was reported, not the date that it actually happened. The tornado actually occurred on the evening of March 27th, but it was reported the next day on March 28th, and that's where all these papers have gotten the date from. And then people see the one article that was about it and see the date there, don't fact check it, and keep publishing it. And to me, this is very reminiscent of the Carnegie Medal situation from episode one, The Legend of the Pigman. So on March 27th, 1890, there was a massive outbreak of tornadoes, and it was dubbed the Storm Demon by some papers, though it appears that some tornadoes may have just been called the Storm Demon, like Storm Demon may have been 
I don't know, a name for tornadoes. Because a couple years after, I still saw things like Storm Demon hits Kansas. And that wasn't really part of the huge event. But I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. I didn't look too much into it. Because as usual, there is a lot of stuff uh, just in regards to this horrific event that I wanted to research further because it was more pertinent to our story of the witch's tree. So this particular outbreak created a number of storms ranging in intensity from F2 to F4 on the Fujita scale. I don't really know much about it, but it is a scale of storms, much like our category of hurricanes, which goes from 1 to 5. So F4 doesn't sound too crazy, but the tornado that hit Louisville was an F4 storm with winds ranging from 207 to 260 miles an hour. So this tornado didn't just go down Maple and Park and make a tree out of a stump. No, it destroyed 766 buildings totaling $2.5 million or the modern equivalent of $71 million in damage. So the storm in Louisville alone initially was estimated to have killed 800 people, though the actual number is between 74 and 120 people. Unfortunately, most of the victims of this tornado were in one building, which was the Fall City Hall building. So newspapers at the time actually had a slew of eyewitness accounts. Now, I will be forthright to say that the sources I acquire historic newspapers from did not have the newspapers from Louisville for this date range. But fortunately, back in the day, a lot of newspapers would run columns verbatim from other areas if it was major news. And I was able to acquire these specific accounts and things that way because they were just reproduced from Louisville's papers. And they were done so word for word, so that leaves very little error for things to be lost in translation. Now, one of the newspapers I read listed off the confirmed dead at the time, which was still rather early. I think it was April 3rd, but I was not able to find the name Mengel anywhere within them. So two of Mr. Mengel's relatives were said to have died in the storm, and at this moment, That's unconfirmed. I have no way of confirming that, but from the sources that I read, I read quite a number of historic newspapers that listed dead people. It was not among them. But again, a lot of people were not identified for quite some time. As you'll find out, uh, it was pretty bad. Oh, also before we get into the real horror of those firsthand accounts, I wanted to talk about the witch's warning. So this story has been told many different ways. The way I told it, I wrote myself. It was very dramatic. It was like a scene from a movie. The chant I said was said to have been left on a note nailed to a tree. It wasn't said to anyone's face. But other sources, or should I say the same exact source, said that the warning had been uttered as a simple beware 11th month to Mr. Mengel. So this particular source I'm talking about is the author and historian David Domine, who gives haunted tours. It's really hard to take his word for it when he was quoted saying this story both ways as this huge poem, essentially, this chant that was nailed to the tree, but also it was said to his face, but it was only one line. I don't know what his book says. I was not able to get a physical copy and I wasn't going to buy the ebook because, you know, money. But he's a professor, so I'm sure he cites things in his book and it might be more clear. Maybe he says it a little bit differently on his tours, but you know me, just stick with the facts, bud. What are the facts? Was this said as beware 11th month to Mr. Mengel's face or is there a mysterious note on the tree? Was there both? I don't know. So I have to say this part of the story is a bit uh, crumbly, much like Fall City Hall. Yeah, what a segue. An excerpt from the Greenville Journal from Thursday, April 3rd, describes what happened at City Hall as this. The great center of death is the Fall City Hall, where more than 200 men, women, and children are entombed. It is situated on Market Street near 12th. The structure was three stories in height, and when struck by the tornado, several meetings were being held within it. The loss of life at this place far exceeds that of any other one locality. And of the great numbers known to be under the debris, it is certain that none will be recovered alive. The ruins are now scarcely one story high, so thorough was the work of the wind. Now it goes on to detail some of what was going on in the building at the time as it was evening, and it's really quite sad. 
On the second floor of this building, Miss App was teaching a dance class of young children, and there were present the mothers, fathers, and other attendants of the gay juveniles. In one of the rooms of this floor, the executive body of the Roman Knights was in session. Of the seven members present, all escaped but one. On the third floor, Jewel Lodge No. 2, Knights and Ladies of Honor, was holding a meeting. It was one of the largest lodges of the order, and there were 150 members present when the building fell. A mere handful of these escaped. It goes on to describe more in attendance, but here is a good part I want to recite to you, which is recounting the tale of A.J. Reed, the past Grand Master L.O.O.F. of the state. I have no idea what that is, but this is what he had to say. I was entering the hallway when the tornado struck the building at the southeast corner. There were several crashes, and the structure began to rock, whereupon the men and women from the Knights of Honor meeting began pouring out from their lodge room adjoining, shrieking in terror. It was only for a moment, though, for the building collapsed, and I found myself on top of the great pile. I was stunned and blinded by the dust, but recovered myself and crawled out. The agonizing shrieks of the others were terrible, and I was finally taken away by a rescuing party. I know I'm doing a lot of reading, but to me, these firsthand encounters are really important to really grasp how terrible this event was. And I think it's really great that we do have these firsthand accounts. So while the story of the witch's tree is super fun, you know, I love witches and I love trees, but this story is so horrifying. And I I don't understand why you would, I guess you would make the fluff piece about the witch's tree. And, you know, it's a lot more involved to bring up these ghosts of the past, but I think it's so important. The dance class of the children is particularly sad. There is one account of a father from the Sacramento Daily Record from Saturday the 29th that is is heartbreaking. So Lewis Sims Jr.'s wife and four kids were in the dance class, and he was pacing outside for hours and hours as the workers tried to move the debris to get to the room where this class was held. So the workers were painstakingly searching these ruins and eventually the dance room was reached and Mr. Sims' wife was found fatally wounded. She did not make it. Three of his four children were recovered unconscious and they were not expected to live. But honestly, to make matters even worse, before his fourth child could be found, a fire erupted in the wreckage and no more bodies were able to be recovered and his fourth child perished in the fire, or at least the body of his child was consumed and he didn't even have the closure of being able to find them. And this must have been the case for many different families and poor Miss App, the school teacher, was one of the bodies that was recovered before the blaze broke out. I'm going to read a couple more stories. I hope you don't mind. I find them super interesting. Not all of them are going to be absolutely heart-wrenching, though some of them will be. But I feel like this Legend of the Witch's Tree is another great example of a city taking a horrible, horrible tragedy that has really impacted the city, impacted the people of the city, and kind of turning it into a more lighthearted legend as a coping mechanism. Here, I'm going to read a short excerpt from the Greenville Journal again about the hat store next door to Fall City Hall. The hat store of Louis Sims Jr. Oh, is that the same? So here's something I just noticed as I went to go read this, because the names are different. So in the Sacramento Daily Record, they reproduce something from one of the Louisville newspapers and said Louis Sims Jr., Here in the Greenville Journal from Thursday, April 3rd, this is a story of Louis Sims Jr. and his family's story. It's the same thing, but different because this wasn't in the dance thing. So this is another issue of newspapers not always being reliable for the time. So I'm going to read this excerpt of this account of what happened with Louis or Louis Sims Jr. The hat store of Louis Sims Jr. adjoining the hall in the east was utterly demolished. Sims was not injured, but his wife was badly hurt, while two young children lived but a few moments after being recovered, and two others were taken out dead. As the children were carried down the ragged pile by stalwart men in the light from the big bonfires, cheer after cheer went up from the crowd of watchers. They were found within a half an hour of each other, but meanwhile the agonized father ran wildly about, begging the workers to save his little darlings. When the third one was lifted out, the father ran up to the pile, grasping the child's bare feet crying piteously, oh, its little feet are cold, and his anguish was heart-rendering. So that's very different from the account from the Sacramento Daily Record. 
Either way, Mr. Sims Jr., his life was completely changed that day and his family was destroyed. So that just goes to show that newspapers, great, but also they get things wrong. So I'm going to do one more really sad story and then we're going to do something more lighthearted. So don't worry, it's not going to end on a sour note. This one is from the Record Union on Saturday, March 29th, 1890. It is labeled a sad incident. Three lives were lost at the corner of 18th and Maple Streets. The killed were John Warrick, aged 40, his daughter, aged four years, and James Fitzgerald. Warrick kept a grocery, and at the time of the catastrophe, there were in the store the proprietor, his wife, daughter, and Fitzgerald. At the first gust of wind, the walls doubled up and the roof dropped in. Warrick was crushed by the falling timbers and was taken out dead. His wife was in an unconscious condition. Later on in the night, the rescuer saw a tiny hand protruding from the debris and the mangled form of the baby girl soon lay beside its dead father. The body of Fitzgerald was next taken out. Which is just another example of just sadness. Now this one's a little more fun. It is from the same issue of the same paper, and it's labeled as carried into the air. A thrilling experience was that of Mrs. Romelay, who kept a dry goods store at Colgan and 17th Streets. At the time of the storm, her nephew, Willie Kilmer, was with her. When the walls began to shake, both of them rushed to the front door as the whirlwind was passing. It gathered in both of them and carried them into the air 40 feet. At Maple Street, they were both hurled against a fence and remained there unconscious until they were found by the neighbors a few minutes later. The lady was badly bruised and perhaps hurt internally. Kilmer's right arm was broken, his ankle sprained, and there was a deep gash in his throat. Okay, maybe not as lighthearted as I remembered it being. Ooh, um, they didn't sound okay. Uh, When I read that initially, I thought that they were moderately fine. So yeah, that was not as lighthearted as I thought. So I did want to mention a really fun news story I did come across that was not part of the storm story. And that is of the chloroform fiend. So this one's too long to actually read, but there's a really weird story called The Chloroform Fiend in the Logansport Pharaoh's Tribune. And it's about this guy named K.F. Fowler, the Chicago drummer crazed by chloroform. And he was going to all these pharmacies asking for chloroform and they wouldn't give it to him and he was all strung out. And I guess it turns out that J.P. Morgan was his uncle and had to come and take him away. (laughs) Like, It's a really, really bizarre story. If you have time, it's in the Logansport Ferris Tribune from Friday, March 28th, 1890. Really weird. J.P. Morgan, a chloroform fiend? What? So more or less, the moral of today's story is cities oftentimes make up legends to cope with really horrible tragedies in their history and in their past. And it seems like the witch's tree is another one of these things. And it also makes a really great, like, tourist destination, tourist trap, and legend. I think it's really fun, but I think it's also important to remember the history as it happened. And while I don't think there's anything wrong with having the witches inserted into this story, I, I, for one, love if you can put witches into every single story imaginable. But let us remember the intense loss of life that happened for one of, no, not one of the, the most deadly tornado event in U.S. history. I think it's a great disservice to history and to the stories of these people to leave that out of the narrative completely. So before I finish and before I close, quick shout out to Jenny who sent me an email uh, to the Crimes and Winch Demeanors podcast and bought something from my Etsy shop. Thank you so much. I'm glad you're enjoying the podcast. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing for now. I may end up making the podcast bi-weekly or maybe just whenever I can get it out. Because it it's a lot more work than I initially thought, and I don't have any episodes banked like at the moment, which would make releasing them a lot easier. But we'll kind of work on that as we go. I think next week's episode might be a little bit different because I am writing a little piece about my friend's home for her website. I had a haunted experience there that I will tell in next week's episode and then talk a little bit more about the history of the house. I haven't uncovered who may be haunting the house since it's a very old house. A lot of people have lived there. And unfortunately, the city of Buffalo doesn't have a lot of online records. 
So I can't really search those to see who may have died in the house and whatnot. But I'm going to do my best. Some interesting characters have lived there. The house is gorgeous. And if anything, my story is so weird, I can't even explain it. And you know how much I love just knocking down every single paranormal thing I can. My experience was just so bizarre. I have no explanation for it. And naturally, the room where I had this haunted experience is where my friend made the nursery for her child. Isn't that what happens in every horror movie? They just put the child in the... Anyways, I digress. That's for next week's episode. As always, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I hope you learned something important about the history of Louisville and the most deadly tornado event in U.S. history. So as usual, if you love our podcast, and by our, I mean me, the collective we that resides within my brain, please leave us a great review on iTunes, share us with your friends. Other than that, don't piss off a witch or a whole coven at that. You will regret it. Leave gifts at Weird Trees in case there are witches that will, you know, do a little boon in your favor. And maybe just use some timber for your maypole next year. I don't know, just a word of advice. Anyways, until next time, stay curious, stay spooky. Bye. Ha 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 ha.